Hi learners, it's M from Sound Nerds, and this video is going to be on the biliary tree where we'll talk about anatomy, physiology, and normal ultrasound appearance. Unit 4, the biliary tree. The biliary tree includes the intra and extra hepatic ducts and the gallbladder. To understand the biliary tree and your role as a sonographer, you will need to understand how the biliary tree comes together and its function. Now beginning with anatomy, you will follow the biliary tree from within the liver to the gallbladder and then the gallbladder to the intestines. You will want to learn about the creation of bile and its pathway and its role in digestion. And lastly, we'll take all of your anatomical knowledge and see how it appears on ultrasound, becoming familiar with how to recognize intra and extra hepatic structures and how to image the biliary tree with a standard protocol. There are a lot of important normal measurements of the biliary tree that the sonographer will need to use for daily clinical use. Section 4.1, Global Anatomy. Let's go ahead and take a look at the big picture of the biliary tree, where it's located and its surrounding features. As an embryo, we all begin as tubes, and then the tubes make pouches and differentiate. At about the same time that the liver starts to develop, so does the biliary tree. During the fourth week of embryological development, the stomach rotates moving from midline to the left side of the body. Then a small little tube below the stomach turns into the duodenum and out pouches into the hepatic diverticulum, which will become the biliary tree, and the cystic diverticulum, which turns into the gallbladder. The gallbladder sits within the gallbladder fossa, which is an indentation on the surface of the liver. This indentation is located on the posterior inferior portion of the right lobe, and you will see the gallbladder fossa is connected to the main lobar fissure. The bile ducts are part of the portal triad, which also includes the hepatic arteries and the portal veins. When inside the liver, or intrahepatic, the portal triad is intrasegmental, meaning they run through the segments of the liver. Once crossing the porta hepatis, the bile ducts become extrahepatic, or outside of the liver. They will continue to course towards the pancreas and intestines. As far as relational anatomy goes, the gallbladder is posterior and inferior to the liver. The duodenum sits medial to the gallbladder, and the extrahepatic bile duct courses anterior to the portal vein. Section 4.2, Gallbladder Anatomy. The gallbladder is a pear-shaped sac. It is divided into three parts, the fundus, or the top of the gallbladder, the body, and the neck. Now the fundus hangs a little bit more inferior into the body. It's rounded, and we can see it hanging just below the inferior margin of the liver. The body of the gallbladder is the central portion, and the neck is the most superior part of the gallbladder. The neck of the gallbladder is continuous with the cystic duct. Now the gallbladder is kind of a floppy organ, so it is very standard in our protocol that we want to roll the patient onto their side to evaluate positional changes. When we roll the patient, the fundus is going to move into more of a medial position in the body. Section 4.3, bile duct anatomy. The biliary tree is comprised of the intrahepatic ducts, which converge into the right and left hepatic ducts, which converge into the common hepatic duct. The cystic duct leads to the gallbladder, and the common bile duct is formed when the cystic duct and common hepatic duct come together. So the intrahepatic ducts start way out in the liver lobules. They are going to be the tiny little bile canaliculi that start way out there and they're going to start to converge and become bigger and bigger as they move towards the porta habitus. Eventually, those ducts are going to consolidate into the right hepatic duct and the left hepatic duct. Now the right and left hepatic ducts are going to merge together and when they do, they are going to form the common hepatic duct right at the porta hepatis. The common hepatic duct is just inside the porta hepatis, running parallel with the portal vein. Outside of the liver, connected to the gallbladder, is a small duct called the cystic duct. And when the cystic duct connects to the extrahepatic common hepatic duct, we will see the formation of the common bile duct. The common bile duct then is going to continue towards the pancreas, moving inferiorly, traverse through a small groove in the pancreatic head, and that's usually the last place that we can see the common bile duct. From there, it is going to join up with the duct of Worsing, or the main pancreatic duct, and then enter into the duodenum, 
through the ampulla of Vater. Some fun little bits about the anatomy of the biliary tree. This is the cystic duct of the gallbladder. So this is the gallbladder body. This is the cystic duct as it would connect with the hepatic duct. Inside of the cystic duct are these small muscular folds. And these are going to regulate the release of bile from the gallbladder. And these little folds are called the spiral valves of Heister. In the little tour that I gave on that image, I also talked about some other key words that you should know about the biliary travel. And so one of them was that at the pancreas head, the common bile duct is going to join with the duct of Worsung. Now the duct of Worsung is also known as the main pancreatic duct, but they come together and they enter into the duodenum together at a spot called the ampulla of Vater. So this little small opening, little hole in the duodenum where those ducts are going to come in, the ampulla of Vater. And right around that ampulla of Vater, is the sphincter of Odi. And the sphincter of Odi is responsible for controlling the release of bile and the pancreatic enzymes into the duodenum. So we have the spiral valves of Heiser that were in the cystic duct that controlled just the bile release. And then we have the sphincter of Odi that goes even further to control bile and pancreatic enzymes. So in this image, we can see the common bile duct coming down. In the pancreas head, it's going to join up with that main duct, the duct of Wurzung. They join together, and then they enter through the ampulla of Vater, right into the duodenum here. The sphincter of Odi then is a muscle that wraps around the bile duct at the ampulla, and it's going to contract and relax as it allows for substances to flow in or stops them because the body doesn't need them at the moment. Section 4.4, vasculature of the gallbladder. This is a super easy section. The only thing you really need to know about the vasculature of the gallbladder is that the cystic artery supplies the gallbladder. If you recall from our hepatic unit, we know that the aorta gives rise to the celiac axis. It has two main branches that we are concerned about with ultrasound. As the common hepatic artery branches off of the celiac axis, it's also going to give rise to the GDA. Once the gastroduodenal artery branches off, we form the proper hepatic artery or the main hepatic artery. The main hepatic artery is then going to branch into the left hepatic artery and the right hepatic artery. And this is where the cystic artery comes off. So the cystic artery supplies the gallbladder as a branch of the right hepatic artery. As far as venous drainage goes for the gallbladder, it just has some small veins that drain the gallbladder via the hepatic portal system. Section 4.5, anatomical variants. Now the gallbladder can take on a lot of different appearances from person to person. There are some more common differences that are known as anatomical variants. These variants are not typically pathology, but we should identify them when imaging the gallbladder and ducts. For the gallbladder, there are six main variants that are visible by ultrasound. Hartman's pouch, Bagerian cap, junctional folds, septations, duplication, and agenesis. Hartman's pouch is found at the neck of the gallbladder. So the neck of the gallbladder is normally a very thin funnel that goes towards the cystic duct. But when a Hartman's pouch is present, there's a little pocket off of the neck. And this is significant because stones can get caught in that pocket and cause issues. Hartman's pouch is also known as an infundibulum. The Phrygerian cap is at the fundus of the gallbladder. It is a fold in the gallbladder wall that puts the fundus back onto itself. This is also another really common spot for stones to get stuck. The term Fragerian cap comes from a similar appearing hat from the Renaissance era. A junctional fold is found between the neck and the body of the gallbladder. Similar to the Fragerian cap, it causes the gallbladder to fold over on itself at the lower portion of the organ. So while holding no real significance, it can change the appearance of the gallbladder. Sometimes we'll see other folds along the body, but they don't have their own names like the junctional fold does. This can really change how the gallbladder appears, but it's not really considered pathologically significant. We can also see a gallbladder that has septations within it. This occurs within the lumen of the gallbladder. You'll see these kind of stringy lines going through the lumen, and it just means that the gallbladder, when it was developing, it failed to open completely. Most of the time they don't cause a whole lot of problems. They might catch some stones or be the cause of some sludge to develop due to bile not moving as freely in the gallbladder. 
but typically they do not cause problems or a patient really doesn't even know that they have them. Gallbladder duplication then is the presence of two gallbladders and it's actually really, really rare. So it can take on different variations. It can have where the two gallbladder lobes share a cystic duct or they can each have their own cystic duct that connects back to the main biliary tree. Duplication is actually really difficult, if not impossible, to confirm 100% by ultrasound, and that's because septations can give a very similar appearance as two gallbladders. And we really don't see cystic ducts by ultrasound, so it would be very difficult to tell for sure if they are sharing a cystic duct versus having their own separate cystic ducts to the system. And lastly, gallbladder agenesis. The A part means without genesis formation of, so gallbladder agenesis occurs when the gallbladder fails to form. As far as ductal variants go, a lot of ductal variants do occur, and it's usually going to be on the intrahepatic ductal side. However, due to the normally very small size of the ducts, the changes in the ductal system are not going to be well appreciated by ultrasound. Section 4.6, microanatomy. The microanatomy for the biliary tree is very minimal. The gallbladder wall is muscular, which helps the gallbladder to expel bile when necessary, and it also has a very rugged interior lining that helps it to reabsorb water and concentrate the bile. So there are five layers to the gallbladder wall, and they are from the inner to out. We've got the epithelium, which is the inside layer, the lamina propria, which is the next layer out, the muscularis, the perimuscular layer, which is kind of a fibrous layer, and then the serosa, which is the external part of the wall. Not all five of these layers are well appreciated by ultrasound, but you can see different echogenicities in the gallbladder wall when it is contracted on itself. Probably one of the more prominent parts then of the biliary anatomy that might relate later into a pathology is the presence of rokitansky ashkoff sinuses. The inside of the gallbladder is very wrinkly appearing. It's got what we call rug eye, and these are just these little pouches of skin that come in and out, kind of causing that wrinkly appearance. So when you have an invagination, of the lining that reaches all the way down to that muscularis level, then we call that a rokitansky ashkoff sinus. So in this image here, we have our epithelium, then our lamina propria, and then we had our muscular layer. And so if you have that like little indentation or invagination that we call it, that goes all the way down to the muscular layer, then we are looking at a rokitansky ashkoff sinus. Now this is really only important for one pathology, but it's a pathology that the boards like to ask you about, and that is for adenomyomatosis. Basically what happens is a crystal will get caught in this little invagination, and then we can see those by ultrasound, they have a very particular appearance to them. Rather insignificant for our study of normal ultrasound appearance, but I can guarantee you that this term will come up again. Section 4.7, Biliary Physiology. For ultrasound purposes, the physiology of the biliary tree is also very simple. There are just a few key facts that we need to know. Most importantly, we need to understand what the bile does, how the bile flows, and what causes the bile to flow, and how it relates to keeping our patient NPO, and what happens post cholecystectomy. In the liver unit, we talked about bile synthesis being one of the functions of the liver. We know that the hepatocytes produce a lot of byproducts during their other functions, and the byproducts become part of the bile formula. Some of the things that we see in the bile from the hepatocytes are going to include bile acids, bile salts, uh, we'll see cholesterol, phospholipids, and some bile pigments, which are going to include the biliverdin and bilirubin, that is a product of hemolysis. Once those products are entered into the bile caniculi from the hepatocytes, they are going to travel through all those little ducts and the ducts are actually going to add some more components to the formula. The ducts are going to add in water, electrolytes, and an alkaline solution, which is a basic solution. Bile is very basic. It has a very bitter taste. If you've ever been sick with vomiting and you've had that bilious vomit, you've probably tasted bile before. It doesn't taste good. By no means do you need to memorize this chart. It's just to show you that most of what is creating bile is the bile salt. The bile salts are going to be what helps us to break down the fats that we ingest. Let's go ahead and cover then how bile moves from the hepatocytes and the lobules to the gallbladder. So this is the first step in getting bile into the intestines. It's got to head to the gallbladder first. So first we're out at the hepatocytes or the liver lobules. They're dumping all of their byproducts into the bile caniculi. And this 
greenish yellow fluid is going to start flowing through these ducts and these ducts are going to start converging together as we move towards the porta hepatis. And these are going to form the intrahepatic ducts. They're going to get bigger and bigger as we get towards the porta hepatis. And eventually, all these intrahepatic ducts are going to come together in the right hepatic duct and the left hepatic duct. The right hepatic duct is responsible for the right lobe of the liver. Left hepatic duct is responsible for the left lobe of the liver. At the porta hepatis, then, the left and right are going to join to form the common hepatic duct. The common hepatic duct joins up with the cystic duct and the bile takes a turn through the cystic duct to go to the gallbladder. Once it makes it to the gallbladder, it's going to hang out there for a while. All those little folds of the epithelium on the lining of the gallbladder well is going to start absorbing back some of that water. It's really going to concentrate the bile so it's better prepared to help us emulsify the fats that we ingest. But to get to the duodenum, we got to go through a few more ducts. So let's take a look at how the gallbladder to the duodenum occurs. So the bile is going to hang out in the gallbladder until we eat something that has a lipid in it or a fat in it. And when that happens, cholecystokinin and secretin are going to stimulate the gallbladder to release its bile. The gallbladder is going to get this hormonal indication that it's time to contract. And the muscle in the gallbladder wall is going to squeeze down and it's going to push the bile out of the gallbladder and into the cystic duct. Now remember that the cystic duct and the common hepatic duct did join. That was to bring bile from the liver into the gallbladder. So this time, instead of going back into the common hepatic duct, it's going to take a turn and go into the common bile duct. Now the common bile duct is going to travel inferiorly towards the pancreas head where it will join up with the pancreatic duct known as the duct of Worsen. Together they are going to join through a hole inside of the duodenum called the ampulla of water and the sphincter of Odi is the muscle that surrounds that hole. The ducts are going to travel through there empty into the duodenum to bring in bile and pancreatic enzymes to help digest food. So speaking of those hormones and those enzymes and the bile that the body needs to help digest food, the two big ones that we need to focus on in relation to the biliary tree are secretin and cholecystokinin. So when we eat, food enters into the stomach and it's going to start mixing with all that stomach acid and kind of get turned around into a kind of paste called chyme. And that chyme is very acidic and that chyme is going to first enter into the duodenum and when that chyme enters the duodenum, its mere presence is going to cause the release of hormones into the bloodstream. Again, the two that apply to the gallbladder and biliary tree are secretin and cholecystokinin. Now, secretin is a hormone that gets released when that acidic chyme is present in the duodenum. The secretin is going to tell the bile ducts to start producing that aqueous portion of the bile formula that's excreted from the bile ducts to mix with the hepatocyte contribution. It's also going to tell the pancreas to start making juices, specifically the one that neutralizes acids. The other hormone that is produced by that chyme entering into the duodenum is cholecystokinin. And cholecystokinin is released when the duodenum recognizes that there are fat and proteins within that chyme. The cholecystokinin is not only going to stimulate the liver to produce bile, but it is also going to tell the gallbladder to release the bile that it has been holding onto. Cholecystokinin also tells the pancreas to release enzymatic juices as well. So the stomach is going to release that acidic chyme into the duodenum. That's going to cause cholecystokinin and secretin to be released. The secretin will tell the bile ducts to release aqueous fluid. It also tells the pancreas to release some enzymes to neutralize that chyme. Now the cholecystokinin is going to tell the gallbladder to contract and expel the bile out and into the ducts. It's going to travel down the common bile duct, meet up with the duct of Worsen, both are going to travel through the ampulla of water and into the duodenum. Once released into the duodenum, the bile is going to interact with the fat that we've ingested. A lot of people think that it just kind of breaks down the fat and then that's just kind of it, but what actually happens, it emulsifies it. And it's really the bile salts from the bile that are going to emulsify the fat or make it into very, very, very tiny fat blobs. 
Once they're in those really small formations, enzymes from the pancreas are actually going to do the rest of the lipid digestion. And when those lipid pieces become even smaller, then they're small enough to be absorbed through the intestinal wall where they can return to the liver for metabolization. Remember, the liver needs that fat to help store vitamins A, D, E, and K. Now, bile also serves as a way to get rid of those byproducts from some of those jobs that the liver is doing. So remember, it gets rid of cholesterol and it also gets rid of bilirubin. And it's actually the bilirubin that causes our poop to be brown. So what we see in patients with gray or pale poop, they most likely have some sort of biliary obstruction causing the bile to not be released appropriately. So we know that the bile sits in the gallbladder to kind of become more concentrated until the body needs it when it is ingested fatty foods and proteins. So when the gallbladder is full of bile, the walls are usually going to be very thin and we can see the contents within it very well as sonographers. This is why we want our patient to be NPO. We want that gallbladder to be as full as possible so we can really evaluate if anything's hiding in there and the thickness of the walls. Once a person eats those fats and proteins, the gallbladder contracts on itself because of that cholecystokinin. It contracts on itself, pushing the bile out and into the system. Once this happens, we can no longer really assess the gallbladder fully. This is why we ask our patients, especially those with gallbladders, to be NPO or nothing by mouth for six to eight hours so we can fully evaluate that gallbladder. Now, if you have a patient that must absolutely eat, they can't get away without it, then it's typically okay. It's something that we need to work around because we want our patient to be safe as well, especially those that are diabetic. Usually, we can get away with them avoiding fatty foods and proteins to help keep their gallbladder distended. Prandial means to eat, so this is the gallbladder before a person is eaten. It's going to be nice and full. Once that cholecystokinin comes in and tells it to activate, it's going to squeeze all this bile out and into the common bile duct. And then we'll see our postprandial gallbladder appear very contracted where those mucosal walls have just collapsed down on another. The muscular part of it might appear thicker as well, and it's going to start to reach our threshold for normal wall measurements. So again, we really want that patient to have a big, nice, juicy gallbladder whenever we can. Another thing that we see in relation to physiology of the biliary tree is what happens in a patient after they've had their gallbladder removed. So gallbladder surgery is a cholecystectomy, that's the removal of the gallbladder. When you say somebody's post-cholecystectomy, that means that they are after having that surgery. Cholecystectomies are very, very, very common abdominal surgeries. Typically, they are done laparoscopically. They are done because a patient has cholecystitis or inflammation of the gallbladder, and that is typically due to the fact that they have gallstones. So once that gallbladder has been removed, there is nowhere to store the bile. And so the bile really just kind of keeps trickling into the duodenum. So a couple of things typically happen. In the patients that are post-cholecystectomy, their common bile duct tends to enlarge, and that is due to something called the reservoir effect, where it will kind of almost act as a secondary gallbladder. And then the other thing that we see is that patients with cholecystectomies tend to have some problems with diarrhea, again, due to the fact that their bile is constantly flowing into their body, not as good at emulsifying those fats, which then can lead to some abnormal bowel patterns. So it is not uncommon to see a relatively large common bile duct in the setting of a post-cholecystectomy patient. Section 4.8, biliary chemistry. Now there really aren't any lab tests that specifically target the gallbladder, but there are some liver chemistry tests that can kind of tell us what is going on, because we've got ones that are related to bilirubin, which is a component of bile. And then we also have just some other imaging and medical tests that can help diagnose gallbladder function as well. If you recall, when we talked about the liver, we talked about the, that there is an idea of hepatocellular disease versus obstructive disease. Hepatocellular disease referred to the hepatocytes not functioning in the ways that we expect them to or being unhealthy, where obstructive disease had something to do more with the biliary tree. The bile ducts become blocked, that blockage causes those byproducts to spill back into the blood and can cause a lot of problems for the body because the body's been trying to get rid of those toxic byproducts. So in biliary disease, we tend to find that this is more of an obstructive disease, which will typically need surgery to relieve the obstruction. Recall that there are a lot of tests that we could use to test the liver, and some are very specific to how the liver functions. 
One of the tests that we did not talk about in the liver unit was the liver function test, bilirubin. But before we discuss bilirubin, we should probably cover unconjugated and conjugated bilirubin just one more time so it's fresh in our minds. Now remember that unconjugated bilirubin is a byproduct of hemolysis. So when the blood is broken apart, it breaks down into a few different components. One of them is bilirubin. And that bilirubin at this point is unconjugated. Albumin is going to come by, pick up that unconjugated bilirubin, and it's going to bring it back to the liver. Once back in the liver, the liver is going to add a sugar to it to make it water soluble. Once the bilirubin becomes water soluble, we call it conjugated. So in the liver is where bilirubin becomes conjugated. The conjugated bilirubin then is released from the hepatocytes into the bile ducts for the most part where it becomes part of the bile formula and will go to the gallbladder and used that way. But some of it does spill into the bloodstream where the kidneys will take care of it. Now the kidneys do not filter out unconjugated bilirubin because it's attached to an albumin, isn't going to fit through the glomeruli that are responsible for filtering our blood. So that is why the unconjugated bilirubin is kind of out in the body hanging out with albumin once it's conjugated, it will leave either via our urine or via the bile and So one of the main tests that tells us, is there a lot of unconjugated versus conjugated bilirubin out in the body is the bilirubin test. Now we can test for total bilirubin, just unconjugated, or just conjugated. Total bilirubin is going to account for both the unconjugated and conjugated bilirubin added together. Starting with the unconjugated bilirubin, if we take a blood draw and see that there is a lot of unconjugated bilirubin within the blood, we are going to start to think a few things. One, that the liver is not taking in the unconjugated bilirubin the way that it should. So maybe there's congestive heart failure, maybe the blood is trying to bypass the liver because it has cirrhosis or just can't get in the liver the way that it normally would. We also wonder if there's more unconjugated bilirubin being produced, which means that somewhere in the body, a lot of red blood cells are being broken down or going through hemolysis. Or we're wondering, is there some sort of disease where the liver can't conjugate the bilirubin? And that is called Gilbert syndrome, which is an inherited disease. So it's either the blood's not getting to the liver to get conjugated, there's way too much hemolysis going on, or the liver just inherently cannot conjugate bilirubin. When we see this blood test performed, it might come under the name as indirect bilirubin. So indirect is the same as unconjugated bilirubin. And when we see an increase of unconjugated bilirubin, it's called unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia or indirect hyperbilirubinemia. So hyper means more, bilirubin refers to the bilirubin, anemia refers to the blood, so that's more bilirubin in the blood. Now, if we look at the conjugated side of things, if we are looking at the blood just looking for conjugated bilirubin, we are going to think that the conjugated bilirubin is there because of some sort of blockage in the biliary system. Normally, that conjugated bilirubin heads out via the bile ducts. It doesn't usually go into the bloodstream, at least not in high amounts. So the conjugated bilirubin, if it's in really high amounts in the bloodstream, that's because there's some sort of blockage in the biliary tree that's causing all of that to back up. The hepatocytes don't want it. They're going to start pushing it into the bloodstream to get rid of it. So that conjugated bilirubin heads out into the bloodstream where we can find it. When we do see an increase in conjugated bilirubin, it is called conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. And conjugated has a secondary name. We know it as direct bilirubin. So we can also say that it is direct hyperbilirubinemia when it is an increase in conjugated bilirubin in the blood. Now, another way we can test for conjugated bilirubin is to also do a urine test. So remember that conjugated bilirubin is filtered out by the kidneys. So if there's a lot of it out in the blood, then the kidneys are going to filter a lot of it into the urine. So if we test the urine for conjugated bilirubin, we might see that there's excessive amounts of it in there as well. And lastly, a test that we did talk about with the liver unit was alkaline phosphatase. This test was more specific to being seen with other biliary blockages. So an increase in conjugated bilirubin and an increase in alkaline phosphatase is going to be highly suspect for some sort of biliary blockage. There are some other tests that can help to diagnose gallbladder issues. 
The ultrasound is excellent for looking for stones and looking for them in the biliary tree. Where we get kind of stuck is how the gallbladder is functioning and if any stones have kind of moved into that ampulla vata area. So one of those tests I can tell how the gallbladder is functioning is called a HIDA scan. Now a HIDA scan is a nuclear medicine test, which is also known as cholecystography or hepatobiliary scintigraphy, and it is going to tell how well the gallbladder is emptying. Remember, we like to see our patients with a full gallbladder. We don't know how well it's emptying later. We don't feed them fatty meals and watch to see if it can empty out. That's actually what the HIDA scan does. They're going to feed them some eggs or something with some fat and proteins in it, and then they're going to watch how that gallbladder is capable of emptying out its bile. Having a gallbladder that doesn't function very well can also be very painful if we don't find stones on ultrasound that can explain some of the patient's symptoms. And as I had mentioned before, when those stones get out of the gallbladder, they can roll through the ductal system and get stuck right at the duodenum. There are a couple tests that are very good at looking for those types of stones where ultrasound isn't that great. So we have an MRCP, which is done with MRI, and it's short for Magnetic Resonance Cholangiopancreatography. And this is going to be a technique for viewing the bile ducts and the pancreatic duct using MRI. However, I feel like more commonly what's going to be performed is called an ERCP, and that stands for Endoscopic Retrograde Cholangiopancreatography. The patient is typically sedated, and a camera is fed down the esophagus into the stomach and into the first part of the duodenum, and they'll stop right at that ampulla of water. From there, they can take samples, they can inject dye, they can do all sorts of things. Typically what they're going to do though is inject that dye. And once that dye is injected, they're going to use fluoroscopy, which uses x-rays, to see if there's any filling defects in the bile duct or in the pancreatic duct. And if those filling defects exist, then they're most likely due to some sort of stone or stricture or just some sort of blockage in the area. So then they can feed tools down the endoscope and they can remove those stones or stent things open and kind of clear out the area so the bile and the pancreatic enzymes can flow the way that they are intended to again. So in this image here, you can actually see uh, just kind of a diagram of that endoscope. It, remember, it's been fed down the esophagus, through the stomach, and into the duodenum, and then they stopped right at the ampulla of water. And now here is a little catheter that's been fed through the ampulla of water, and it's going to inject dye into the bile duct here. This is the pancreatic duct. And when they go to x-ray this again, what they'll see is just this little defect in the bile duct where that dye wasn't able to go because of the stone. And they can just kind of pull that out and it'll just drop into the intestines and leave the body. Section 4.9, normal ultrasound appearance of the biliary tree. So now that we've learned all about the ins and outs of the biliary tree, we're gonna take a closer look at how it appears by ultrasound. Remember, there are a lot of normal measurements that we need to take note of as sonographers. At the end, we'll take a closer look at the standard protocol for imaging the biliary tract. In the patient who has been fasting or is NPO, the normal gallbladder is going to appear anechoic with a thin echogenic wall. So here we have the gallbladder, nice and anechoic, nothing in here, no sludge, no stones, surrounded by a very thin echogenic wall. Again, another example here, we've got anechoic lumen surrounded by the echogenic wall. Notice how the fundus of the gallbladder is hanging just outside of the inferior margin of the liver. We've got the body and then the neck more superior, more into the liver. We've actually got the portal vein here, so you can see that the neck is indeed more superior in this image. In the transverse view, the gallbladder tends to take on a little bit more of a triangle or circular shape. You should still have that nice anechoic center with the bright echogenic walls around it. You can see the main lobar fissure is going to be connected to the gallbladder fossa. So this is the main lobar fissure here. This gallbladder fossa happens to have a gallbladder in it. However, if this person had had their gallbladder removed, it's not so much that you can see the indentation here, but you can kind of tell where the gallbladder used to sit. And the best way to find that area is by finding the main lobar fissure. Ultrasound is an excellent way to measure the gallbladder wall. 
and is one of the gold standards for diagnosing cholecystitis. So remember, cholecystitis is the inflammation of the gallbladder. And when the gallbladder becomes inflamed, we see that the wall starts to thicken. So in our normal patients, we want to measure along the anterior wall of the gallbladder. You can do this in long or in trans, whichever represents the wall the best. And you're going to measure AP, so anterior to posterior, and your measurement in your normal gallbladder should be less than three millimeters. Three millimeters and more indicates a thickened gallbladder wall. Now, if your patient is not NPO and has that thickened wall, then that might just be a physiological response to the patient eating. If the patient has said, yeah, I did eat, you should mark down their NPO status so it doesn't raise any flags when you have this thickened gallbladder wall measurement. So in this example up on top here, we have our gallbladder in long, probably could have been cleared out a little bit more, but we can see the wall nicely here. And we have a nice measurement on it at 0.18 centimeters, which would be the same as 1.8 millimeters. So we are well under a threshold of three millimeters. Here's another example with the gallbladder in trans. Again, remember we are going to measure the anterior wall. We can measure anywhere along this interface of the liver, tends to be where you're going to see it best. You're going to start to get artifacts and artificially thickened walls if you go anywhere other than that anterior wall. So in this example, we've got a nice anterior posterior measurement and we can see that that one is coming in at two millimeters, which is again under our normal threshold. I also want to point out that as you do more and more abdominal scans, you'll become very good at identifying the gallbladder and typically not have any issues with it. But what I see happen with new scanners, especially when they are scanning really thin patients, there's a lot of round things right here. We've got the gallbladder, the IVC, and the aorta all kind of in this area. And when you're not really familiar with what you're looking at, it's easy to go to the IVC or go to the aorta thinking that's your gallbladder. If you are ever in doubt, put color on and see which structure does not fill with color. That's going to be your gallbladder. Now we don't typically measure the length or the width of the gallbladder like we do with the other organs. We typically are only interested in that wall measurement. However, once you've done enough studies, you will see that sometimes that gallbladder just looks really big and sometimes they do put calipers on out of curiosity what it measures. As far as measurements go, the normal gallbladder should not measure more than 10 centimeters in length or more than four centimeters in width. If it exceeds 10 centimeters in length or that four centimeters in width, then we have a distended gallbladder. And that distended gallbladder is known as a hydropic gallbladder. And that could be due to a stone that we can't see, or it could be due to a malfunctioning gallbladder. Hard to say unless we see that stone, but it's worth noting if you see an overly extended hydropic gallbladder. Moving to the bile ducts then, we need to identify where the common hepatic duct is and the common bile duct. Now these are going to appear as small anechoic tubular structures with very thin echogenic walls. In this example here, this might not look as smooth or thin, but this is the common hepatic duct turning into the common bile duct. Remember the common hepatic duct is intrahepatic where the common bile duct is extrahepatic. You need to identify where the porta hepatis is to identify those internal and external ducts. Here's another probably clearer example of a very normal bile duct. So again, we have the porta habitus. So we can identify the common hepatic duct on this side and the common bile duct on this side. But again, let, notice that it is a tubular structure with those thin echogenic walls surrounding it. This is a cross section of the portal triad before it is entering into the liver. So this is called that Mickey Mouse sign. We have the portal vein as the head, hepatic artery as the right ear, and the common bile duct as the left ear. Another key identifier that we can use to identify where the common hepatic duct starts and the common bile duct ends is the right hepatic artery. So here we have a diagram of the portal vein the hepatic artery and the bile ducts all flowing together. So at this first cross section is where we are getting this image. So we are seeing kind of the confluence of the superior mesenteric vein and the splenic vein, 
the common bile duct, and the common hepatic artery, along with the GDA. GDA breaks off, portal vein comes all the way together, so now we have the proper hepatic artery, the common bile duct, and the portal vein, and that's going to match up with this middle section here. This last grouping is considered inside the liver, and we know that because now we can see the right hepatic artery and the left hepatic artery, the portal vein, and the common hepatic duct. So when we see the presence of that right hepatic artery, we know that we are inside the liver. So what does that look like by ultrasound? Well, here we have our common bile duct and our portal vein, which is a little off axis in this image, but it would be flowing right through here. This little cross section right here, this is the right hepatic artery. This right here is this vessel right here. And so when we see that right hepatic artery coursing either anterior or posterior to the common bile duct, we are going to know that anything on this side of it is the common hepatic duct, any on this side is the common bile duct. And I just want to point out too, it lines up fairly well with our porta habitus. So this can be another visual reminder of where the internal and external ducts are situated. So here's an example from another ultrasound of the right hepatic artery being used as our landmark. So we've got the right hepatic artery here. This is portal vein, uh, IVC below it here. And what we are seeing is the bile duct traveling through here. So if this is our right hepatic artery, this means that this is our common hepatic duct. Anything on this side inside the liver would be the common hepatic duct. The bile duct out here would be the common bile duct. Note too that color is used to identify the vasculature in the area where ducts in the area will not fill with color. They do not have blood flow through them. So we should always use color when we are identifying our ducts, especially at the porta hepatis. Another way that we can find the common bile duct is to identify the pancreas head. And this is going to help to ensure that you have made it well outside the liver and are in an extra hepatic location, proving that it should be the common bile duct. So here we have the pancreas head. And what we are seeing here is one little black anechoic circle and a second black anechoic circle. The more anterior one is the gastroduodenal artery or the GDA. If we were to put color on this picture, we should get color here, 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 everywhere except for in the common bile duct. So the more anterior one is the GDA. The more posterior one then is the common bile duct. You can then use your fine-tuned transducer skills to elongate the circle out and follow that back to the porta habitus to fully view the common bile duct. Once you have your duct elongated, you will then perform measurements on it. Now the normal common hepatic duct, remember the intrahepatic duct, the common hepatic duct, should measure less than four millimeters. And when you perform that measurement, make sure that you're measuring from inner to inner on those echogenic walls. So we wanna be on the inside of the walls, not including the walls. We just wanna measure where that bile is going to flow. As you're measuring the common bile duct, remember that there can be a lot of variation with it. Typically we say anything less than six millimeters is for the most part normal, but if the patient has had a cholecystectomy, we know that the reservoir effect can cause the common bile duct to increase in size. And the other thing that can cause the common bile duct to increase in size is something called presbyductia. Now presbyductia says that for every decade over the age of 50, the common bile duct can increase by one millimeter and still be considered normal. So if we see a seven millimeter common bile duct in a 60 year old, that's okay, that's probably normal. If we see an eight millimeter and they're 70, that's again, okay, that is normal. That's that one centimeter for every decade over 50. So because of these two things, we typically don't say that the common bile duct is dilated until it reaches at least 10 millimeters or one centimeter in the anterior posterior dimension. So there are three big measurements for the gallbladder. We want less than three millimeter wall, less than four millimeter common hepatic duct, on average, we want a less than six millimeter common bile duct, 
but know that it can be up to 10 millimeters and still kind of be considered normal depending on their cholecystectomy status or how old they are, which we would expect to see a normal dilation of the common bile duct. We are now at our last section, the biliary protocol, section 4.10. Just like we saw in the liver unit, we know that the biliary tree should be examined with most of our abdominal exams. The biliary tree is examined during a liver protocol, during the right upper quadrant protocol, and in the abdomen complete protocol. In fact, it's probably one of the bigger reasons why we perform ultrasound exams. And that's because there's a lot of really acute indications that go along with biliary tree obstructions. The biggest one is probably going to be the right upper quadrant pain. Right upper quadrant pain is commonly associated with some sort of blockage, stones or cholecystitis, not always, but commonly. We might see a positive Murphy sign. A positive Murphy sign is when you are pushing down on the abdomen, you have the patient take a big breath in, and that gallbladder will slide under where you are pushing. And if it hurts, when that gallbladder slides under either your transducer or your fingers, if the doctor is doing the examination, then that is considered a positive Murphy sign. Usually those patients will kind of catch their breath as they breathe in. Uh, some patients just complain that you're on their ribs and that kind of hurts. That's not really a positive Murphy sign. You really want to elicit a kind of a strong reaction from them to prove a positive Murphy sign. But that also leads us to believe that there's something wrong with the gallbladder, like cholecystitis. Uh, nausea and vomiting are common symptoms that go along with it. Pain radiating to the right shoulder or to the scapula is another telltale sign of gallstones. The nerves that attach to the gallbladder also innervate some of the shoulder area as well. So when you have irritation of the nerves by the gallbladder, it can kind of be felt as if it's going up into the shoulder or up into the back. If there are blockages within the biliary system, that bilirubin spilling out into the blood can cause a person to become jaundice, which means that their skin will start to turn yellow and we'll see abnormal liver function tests along with that. Might see that these people start to lose their appetite because they're not able to digest things very well. They're not very interested in eating. And then we'll see that they might also have an intolerance to fatty foods or dairy products. Again, if their bile is not able to get into their duodenum to help digest those foods, it does not feel very good and usually results in some changes in their bowel habits. This is not an exhaustive list, but it does cover a lot of the main reasons why we would perform an ultrasound and look for biliary causes for the patient's symptoms. We mentioned it earlier in this lecture that the patient should be NPO, which stands for nil per os, for at least six to eight hours. We also don't want the patient to be chewing gum or smoking or talking a lot, as that will introduce air into the system. But anytime that the biliary tree is highly suspected for pathology, we really want to try to get that patient to be NPO so we can fully evaluate that gallbladder and get really good images of the wall and make sure that there's nothing hiding out in there that might be causing the patient pain. As far as children go, we typically only need them NPO for three hours. We don't want to starve our little ones. And then patients who are diabetic, you should also pay attention to them as well. They need to eat to keep their blood sugars stable. Always make sure to observe patients a little bit closer that might be susceptible to blood sugar issues. If a patient needs medication, they can always take their medication. It should just be with a small sip of water in the morning. As far as transducers go for imaging the biliary tree, typically we are just going to stick with our same transducer that we've chosen to evaluate most of the other abdominal organs. So that'll be your curvilinear or convex transducers or possibly even a vector transducer, usually using a frequency somewhere between one and seven megahertz. When we are scanning the gallbladder, we always, always, always want to make sure that we are looking at it in multiple positions. So commonly, we will start with the patient supine and take images in the supine position, and then we roll the patient onto their side so they are LLD or left lateral decubitus. Rolling the patient into the left side makes the gallbladder kind of open up, flop over, and if there are any stones in there, then we are going to see that those stones are going to roll down into a different part. A big part of di a big part of diagnosing cholelithiasis, which is gallstones, is to see these echogenic structures with shadowing behind them move into another area. 
Another thing that we can see moving in the gallbladder is sludge. And these are going to look like kind of low gray levels. And we'll see that move into a new area because it is gravity dependent. Sometimes we'll see little flecks of stuff floating in that anechoic bile as well. We want to move that gallbladder around, see if we can shake anything up in there to see if we can visualize any stones or debris or sludge moving within the gallbladder. If a stone is present, quite often we want to make sure too that it is not stuck in the neck. So sometimes you might actually have to roll your patient all the way over to prone to really get that gallstone to roll out of the neck and up towards the fundus. So don't be afraid to move your patient around. Here we've got an example of a stone, rather large one, starting up at the neck. And then as that patient rolls, we'll see the stone moves to the fundus as well. So again, we are looking for mobile structures within the gallbladder when we roll our patient. When acquiring basic biliary images for your protocol, you should try to image the patient in the two positions, so along in the trans in supine and then along in trans in LLD or left lateral decubitus. You can measure the wall in both or either or all of them. You just want to take the measurement that best represents what the gallbladder wall looks like. Remember to always take a picture with and without your measurements. As far as looking at the bile ducts, you'll want to make sure that you're evaluating both the common hepatic duct and the common bile duct elongating them out as much as possible as you can have a blockage towards the distal portion of the common bile duct that can cause dilation further upstream. So if you see any sudden changes in the duct measurement, you'll want to document it and look in the area for any sort of issues. We are going to measure the common hepatic duct and the common bile duct. Remember it's inner to inner. Use color to help you identify the common hepatic duct and the common bile duct and show your landmarks to prove that you are intrahepatic and extrahepatic for these structures. Remember too that you might find that some people look better in supine for their ducts, or some people are actually going to image better when you have them rolled. So make sure to double check and use all your windows, use all your patient positioning, use your patient breathing to help get you the clearest images of the ducts as possible. And that brings us to the end of our biliary unit, talking about abdominal anatomy, physiology, and normal ultrasound appearance. Make sure to go through the activities that are in your workbook and go through the nerd check questions, which are open-ended questions that you can use to help quiz yourself on the anatomy presented in this lecture.